Hi, Mike Zipser here at Balticon 50 in our makeshift studio. And with me is none other than the illustrious Connie Willis. Hi. Hi. Welcome back to Fast Forward. Thank this you. Is I think your fourth time. I with believe us? so. Yeah. And I'm excited to be here. And we're excited to have you. Uh, so we're at Balticon 50, the 50th uh, Baltimore Science Fiction mm -hmm. Convention. And one of the things they did, I just want to touch on this a little bit at first, is they took some of the guests to view like Hubble. The Hubble. Yes. 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 So and it, what was it like? It was very cool. <laughs> and the people at Hubble kept saying, We are so excited to see you guys. We're so thrilled that you're here. And we kept going, You're thrilled. We're thrilled for heaven's sake. So it was wonderful. Um, we got to see them where they work, and of course that's, you know, it's computers and equipment and we don't understand it, but, but um, and they also did a, a PowerPoint on and how they get the images from the Hubble and how they turn the black and white images into the color images and all that. And that was really informative, but, um, but mostly it was just really exciting to be with these people who do such good work. They're going to do the, the interview or the panel that they did with the scientists from there and us uh, is supposed to be up on YouTube shortly and is on the NASA site, I think, right now. So, and it's, it's fascinating because we were talking about, they wanted to talk about the differences between the sciences and the arts, and we basically told them there weren't any, that they were not two opposite you know, kinds of thinking that they're much more connected than people imagine. And, yeah, it's and true. Yeah. it's true. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, it was it was a re really interesting day, and we were really lucky to get yeah. to go there. I heard about it and was a little jealous. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was just it was just a wonderful thing. And my husband's a physics professor, and he was thrilled to be able to be there. I mean, it's just Hubble is so wonderful, and they have when you walk in, they have a big. Um, picture of, I mean, it's like a wall-sized picture of the deep field picture where you think you're looking at stars and you're really looking at galaxies. Oh, yeah. That makes you feel really important in the universe, you know. So, but it was, it was wonderful and, and uh, it, it was just, it was a terrific experience. So. Now, did you get any story ideas out of it? You know, it, th that'll take a while probably, but, um, but one of the things was they asked me what my favorite thing was and I said, the fact that you have windows. Because, you know, most of those places don't have, they're just, you know, banks of computers in there. But here, it wasn't, it was repurposed from something else. And so there are big banks of, of windows looking out over these, the tops of these extremely tall trees, and um, which are growing up from way below the, the lab. And I said, I think that's the best thing you have going for you because you're going to look up and you're going to look out at the natural, you're looking at all these, all this data and then you're going to look at the natural world and you're going to make connections that will be really exciting. So. And see, that's where the artist comes in. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think drawing, drawing connections and, and they talked a lot about um, why they did the, what the Hubble pro project was supposed to discover and then what it really discovered. Because of course, you have to be able to ask the question first before you can find the answer and they didn't even know to ask the questions in a lot of things and so all this thing about exoplanets that we're hearing about now and the black holes and just dozens of things they're discovering um, di differences in what they expect to find versus what they really find and that's leading to whole new questions so the Hubble just keeps going and going and going you know and well after the the main answer is gotten. Yeah, and know. then you also saw the, the web? The yeah, they're, web. they're working uh, on, starting work on the web, well, no, that's not right. They're nearing completion on the James Webb telescope. And then they are working on something called, I think, W1, and which has come even bigger than the James Webb and will be able to do even bigger, different things. And so it was really <laughs> cool, I have to say. And of course, being the writers, our questions were all, what if it doesn't unfold when you get it up there? What if the computer crashes? What if, you know, since all science fiction is based on Murphy's Law, <laughs> you right. know, uh, we were we could think of a thousand things that could go wrong. And, they and the story's saying, always better. Uh, yeah, <laughs> if things go wrong, right. Yes, because we know you writers, you love yeah. to torture your characters. We do, but not for them. It's not better <laughs> if it doesn't go right. So. They told, it, talked to us about some of the redundancies and how they model all these things, and, and it will unfold. And it always has. I mean, that's the amazing thing, that you've got something uh, made of paper clips and aluminum foil, and you've got it up there and thousands of miles away, and, and yet 
you know, it goes off like clockwork. So and we get these incredible these data to learn so stunning, much. Stunning, stunning pictures. Yeah. Yes, they are just amazing pictures, and I. You know, I love it that the universe is not just cool, but that it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And uh, it just, you, it makes you want to go there, you know? Yeah, yeah. Now let's talk a little bit about, you've got a book coming out in October, October. 2016, mm -hmm. giving the year because we don't know when people will be watching this. Right, right. And it's called Crosstalk. Crosstalk. Mm -hmm. And it's got to do with telepathy yeah. and privacy and yeah. cell phones. Cell phones. <laughs> it's a it's a it's an information age kind of book where we're you know, we're just bombarded with with beset on all sides. You know, we don't get a minute's piece. The phone rings and the people are texting us and people are are you know, swiping their phones to find a date and people are there's there's email input and if I leave when I go home from Baltimore I will have eight million emails to sort through and um, and th there's a sensation that we're just you know there is no we're just bombarded all the time too much information and um, and so and my heroine is bombarded not only by that but she also has a very bossy and and nosy um, Irish family who are constantly, they have no boundaries at all, and they make her life <laughs> a misery. And, um, and then there's the, the geeky guy, geeky genius, tech genius, and who works down in the basement and hates the information age and wears earbuds at all times, which are not connected to anything, just so he doesn't have to talk to people. And um, those, those people also are constantly harassing her and pestering her and making her life a misery. And in fact, the reason she likes her new boyfriend so much is that he, he has a, a doorman guarded a point, a, apartment. <laughs> and so she can go up there and not be harassed by everybody and shut the world out and shut her family out and, and just, you know, have a little peace and quiet. And so, um, so, but they are, her boyfriend wants her to have this new, um, little tiny, teeny tiny brain surgery thing done. Back of your neck, no problem. Outpatient, basically, um, surgery. And when you have it done, then, then you are connected with your partner. Um, if you are emotionally connected, you are empathically connected. And you do not, not, not telepathy or anything, just you, you won't fight over which restaurant to go to. You'll know when your girlfriend is annoyed with you because you forgot the birthday. You know, all those different things. And, it, and she thinks, she's, well, she's not really eager to have more information input here, but she's eager to escape her family and escape all this harassment, so she's willing to do it. So she, but the geeky guy in the basement thinks it's a terrible idea. He's convinced it's coma, and they'll steal her organs while she's <laughs> under the anesthetic. And or that something worse will happen. She'll come out a vegetable, etc. Her family tries desperately to talk her out of it because they don't approve of her boyfriend because he's not Irish. All these things, and but she does it anyway, and partly because she just wants an open and honest relationship. And then she comes through the surgery. Her organs are not stolen. She is not a vegetable. But but this is a book, so Murphy's Law. So. She is full-blown telepathic, and she is connected telepathically not to her boyfriend, but to the geeky guy in the basement. And things go downhill pretty much from there. It sounds a bit like something that you love, which is a romantic comedy. Yes, it is it, definitely a romantic comedy. And uh, it's one in which I get to talk about our information society, ways of connecting, helicopter mothers, um, just all kinds of, of fun stuff. Um, also, saints quite a bit, and other possible telepaths of history, and ah. all kinds of stuff. So it was, it was. I would say it was fun to write, but I, I, it went through endless rewrites, and my editor were not, and I were not always on the same page with those rewrites. And so um, it, it was kind of, it was a messy book and harder to write than I originally thought. And of course, telepathy is one of those things that if you write about it. You, you lose all kinds of things that you would ordinarily use in a book, you know, where the characters are misunderstanding because they're not saying what they mean and so on. And you suddenly find you've, you've stripped yourself of all this stuff that you can't use. And, and you've, yet you've still got to put 
complications in their way. Of yeah, how do you have a romantic comedy without misunderstandings? Well, it was a little tricky. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's still misunderstandings, and of course, way, way more problems. Because I personally, I'm one of those people who think that telepathy would just be a terrible idea. The only thing saving us is that we don't know <laughs> what each other are thinking. Oh, I totally agree with you on <laughs> and that. Especially yeah. in personal relationships, <laughs> but in every other kind of relationship, too. And I, one of the ideas for the thing came from a panel I was on, and uh, the guy was just, oh, he's the moderator, just was driving me crazy. And, uh, and I said, and we were talking about telepathy, and I said something about, you know, thank God people don't know what we're thinking. And, and he turned to me and he said, well, when have you ever had a thought that you didn't express? And I thought, right now. <laughs> and if I did express it, your head would explode. So, so it's partly based on that idea and on all the complications that can result from, from um, when you're seeking more honesty and openness in a relationship, you can end up with the exact opposite. She did, my poor heroine does nothing but lie from beginning to end of this book. So, which, which, so. Because I was going to ask you about the kind of the seed for the book, but let's talk a little bit about, about the process of creating a book like this. You had this, this idea, idea about telepathy idea. and how bad it would be. And how did you get from that? Because you have, you know, the ideas, people ask science fiction writers, right. where do you where get your ideas? ideas? Well, they're all around you. Right, they are. They're everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, and they're, they're, and they're um, you know, I think the biggest misconception people have is that they'll say, where do you get the idea? Which implies that there's an idea, one per story. And the truth is it's actually that you're connecting things that haven't been connected before. Like here, I was trying to connect our whole smartphone too much information technology with the idea of, of telepathy being one more level of that. And um, that we try to solve our problems. We, we, we constantly are trying to, to get relationships to be easier. You know, we're going to have e-harmony or we're just going to be able to swipe pictures and see what we like. And we think that it's a matter of, I find somebody who likes Italian food and science fiction and, and white wine and all is solved. And of course, that has nothing to do with relationships. Relationships are all about sacrifice and 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 um, compromise. Compromise and and deeper, like a classic of, of romantic comedy, is always the idea that you you put together this mismatched couple. But then the truth is, as you go farther, you realize that they're mismatched only on the surface. And no matter what the surface looks like, really, these two people have a great deal in common. And here's what it is, and that's they find that, and then they have a relationship. So, so I was interested in all those ideas, and then I was also interested in all the stupid telepathy junk that's, you know, the ESP experiments of Dr. Ryan and at, you know, the at Duke at University. Duke, I, I went to Duke. Yes, so you and, heard a lot about Dr. Ryan. Yes, and the well, cards. and I am. I'm from Colorado, which is where Bridie Murphy came oh. from. How humiliating <laughs> is that? And and all these different things that, you know, the people now who think we can all, if we all think world peace together for two seconds, we'll get it. You know, I'm, it's just so bogus. And so uh, I wanted to put the lie to all of those things, you know, so convince you that telepathy doesn't exist by <laughs> having telepathy exist and stuff. And then, and then about all the how everybody thinks it would be great to know what other people were thinking and but I mean aside from the I could you know my marriage could break up in moments if my husband knew what I was thinking <laughs> aspect there's also the whole what makes you think that you would be left alone my god you would you know the CIA the NSA that Wall Street would you would be the greatest insider trader ever you know, advertisers or advertisers and the people who who you who would want to get you to uh, find out the codes into people's computers and their passwords and I mean it's just it would be terrible and so um, things rapidly get very serious in this book uh, even though it's a light toned book the things at stake are really pretty serious and I'm so thrilled that you're you're doing a romantic comedy because we have talked about how much you love romantic comedies, and I do too. I do, and, <laughs> and they're not romances, and that's yeah. the hardest job that I have is convincing people the difference between the romantic <laughs> comedy and the romance. They're two different species. Oh, yeah. So, but yeah, I, I, and I was, I'm very happy with this book, but, uh, but I'm happy now after many, many rewrites, and, and um, so I'm, I'm very pleased that, that it's coming out, and I got to, to get, I just 
got into all sorts of bizarre areas I didn't think I was going to get into when I started the book. So. And I saw the cover for it. Yeah. And it's a beautiful, who did the cover? I yeah, couldn't find I out who the I don't know. Is. It's, a, it's a photographer. Oh, and it's, so it's a... And it's, it's, I think it looks great. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's like exactly. a man and a woman, and they're falling, like falling they're and falling. reaching out. Yeah, pretty yeah. Cool. Did you? Maybe you won't want to answer this. Did you crib anything from any of the classic romantic comedies while you were writing this? Did you like slip in anything? I don't. There, there are quotations at the beginning of every chapter that are taken directly from romantic comedies. From, from the from the movies we love. Absolutely, <laughs> the movies that we love. Um, but I. I wasn't thinking of any particular, I mean, this is a mis classic mismatched couple, yeah. which is a standard of, of romantic comedy. And I, you know, my goal is to find new, really good romantic comedies. And, you know, the phrase, many Bothans died to bring <laughs> us this information. My husband and I have sacrificed ourselves and watched so many terrible movies that claim to be romantic comedies or are advertised that way, and they, they don't even have a clue as yeah. to what a romantic comedy is. But we found this wonderful one just recently, and that is, no, I'm not gonna talk about Primeval, my favorite <laughs> television show, which oh, is in fact I a romantic comedy. Um, but uh, this was called Sleeping With Other People. Oh. And it it is not, it's the last movie that you would, we got it, you know, we got it through Netflix because they said it was a romantic comedy, and it's about um, a couple of, sex addict to meet at a sex addict uh, anonymous meeting, whatever those are. And, um, and I would never have thought this would be a good romantic comedy. And, and as we went through it, I was like extremely nervous. I'm like, are you, do you know what you're doing? Or are you gonna blow this? And it's great. It's, I'll, I'll remember. It's, it's got one of the best endings I've seen in a long time. I promptly bought a copy, shipped it off to my daughter, and said, you have to watch this, <laughs> and you have to tell me what you think. And she adored it and is passing it on to other people. So I will remember that yes. and get on Netflix when I get home with, yes. with my wife it's, and watch yes, it. Yes, <laughs> it's just a great movie. So it's a little, I don't recommend it to everybody because it's kind. It's R rated, and it's, it's not your standard romantic comedy. So I'm like, there are friends I have who... They don't want anything tougher than mm. when Harry met Sally, so I'm not going to show that this to them. But it all, oh, oh, very romantic. I, yeah. will, I will, I will, check Great that movie. out. Great movie. So you finished Crosstalk. I finished and That's Crosstalk. coming out. Mm -hmm. Have you started anything new? You know, I'm I'm hesitant to start <laughs> because I was under deadline for so long and I was under so much pressure. And I'm too old to be under that much pressure. So I'm working on some short stories right now. I have a couple of stories that I started before the book and then I read the first half at a convention and then since then people have been bugging me where is that story whatever happened to that story where did that story come out and the truth is neither one of them is done so I'm working on those stories I'm gonna finish those I'm working on a couple of other new things um, one about the Isle of Capri and one about uh, a mysterious bookshop I've always loved mysterious bookshop stories and then um, but the next book I'm not I'm not totally sure yet. One thing, um, I had originally, instead of this telepathy novel, I was going to work on my Roswell novel, which is a, kind of a road picture novel, um, and all about Roswell and alien invasions and all kinds of things, and uh, which I also don't believe in, but, but which I thought would be very funny. And I want to tell the real story of Roswell because people don't understand that they know exactly what happened at Roswell. It's not a mystery. It's, it is a cover-up, but it was a cover-up of a Cold War era project, not a cover-up of aliens. Right. And so I, I want to get all that out there. And I want to explore my conspiracy theory about why Monument Valley appears in so many places in Westerns. I mean, so many geographical places in Westerns. It moves all the time, you know? <laughs> it's so weird. And I w was watching um, Evolution with uh, David Duchovny. It's a science fiction movie. And, and it was like sort of north of Glen Canyon. I'm like, no, it's not. It's south of Glen Canyon. And then, of course, in the original Stagecoach, it's somewhere between Tucson and Lordsburg <laughs> at the bottom of everywhere. Arizona. It goes everywhere. I am so excited <laughs> that you're doing 
more your short fiction because I love it. Okay. Oh, and we have run out of time. Oh, I'm sorry. And and that's fine. And I just love talking to you. And thank you so much for taking your time out of your incredibly busy schedule to talk with well, us. Well, thank you. I'm glad that I got to come. And that's it for me at Fast Forward and for Connie Willis. Thanks for joining us.